Good evening, everyone, or good morning if you're in North America. Uh, welcome to the web this webinar of the Gerhard Center webinar series, The Aftermath of COVID-19, The New Social Impact Ecosystem. Today, we are very honored to have with us Olivier Kaiser, He's the founding partner of Hystra Hybrid Strategies Consulting. He's going to talk with us about the journey of multinational corporations to inclusive business. Olivier will share with us his thoughts on how corporations can achieve the right balance between exploring opportunities yet focusing on the sweet spot where they can best achieve impact in the most distinctive way. They will also the balance between leading decisively yet learning to collaborate, the balance between learning and testing yet scaling up, and the balance between protecting yet mainstreaming the inclusive businesses. Olivier is a strategy consultant, entrepreneur, over 40 years of international experience in business, not-for-profit, and public sectors. He founded Hystra in 2009, leading innovative work to design, implement hybrid strategies in the field of access to water, sanitation, ICT, nutrition, energy, and housing. He has led Hystra work with leading companies such as Unilever, Danone, Kimberly-Clark, Mars, Lafarge Holcim, Total, and foundations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, aid agencies such as the AFD, social enterprises such as Frontier Market, and more. He has a deep expertise for global business strategies and management, having spent 18 years with McKinsey, based in Europe, the USA, and Asia, advising the top management of some of the largest global corporations. He was selected he was elected as a senior partner in 1998. He's a board member of a 15 billion euro corporation and a fast growth solar social enterprise. Without much ado, I want to thank uh, very much, Olivier, for being with us. And I, the floor is yours, Mike. Thank you so much, Ali, for this very kind and generous introduction and uh, an invitation to speak uh, to uh, to your group. Um, I'm very delighted to have this opportunity. Um, I have prepared a few slides that I will share with you. And hopefully this is working. Is it working? Yes, yes, yes. it is. Yes, fantastic. Yes, it very is. Good. So indeed, my, uh, my remit today is to share with you some of the learnings uh, we have developed over the last uh, 13 years, working with some of the large multinational corporations in their journey to inclusive business. And um, let me start uh, by telling you a bit where, well, what are the changes that we have seen happen to the expectations society has from large corporations. Um, can I get it to move? Why can't I? Okay. Um, so here you see a picture, uh, which is probably not taken in Cairo, where there is a, this white car has had an accident um, and the red car is coming. Someone is driving this red car and uh, this person was not there when the accident took place. Um, but the question is, if this person doesn't stop, is he or she guilty? Um, different people will have different views on that. But uh, in, in many countries, uh, people will say, no, if they are in a position to help and they don't, then they will be guilty. Uh, the relation of duty, I think, is the term in English. I think this is what has happened to uh, corporate expectations that society has about corporations. They see corporations as very powerful because they have money, they have technology, they have networks. They can do lots of good things for the world. And it's not enough for corporations to say, I've done nothing wrong. I didn't cause this accident. It's not enough anymore. If they are obviously they need to do everything to, to do to do nothing bad, but if they're in a position to help, 
is they are in the position to contribute positively to the world and they don't, then I think that society will consider them guilty. And that's a fundamental change in paradigm because it's relatively easy to demonstrate that you have done nothing wrong. But it's much more difficult to see, to demonstrate that there was nothing that you could have done that would have been positive for the world. So a positive, an inclusive business, what do we mean by this? It has to be a business and it has to be profitable for it to be sustainable, but it also wants to have positive impact on the planet, on the people. So uh, having both is, is complicated. I mean, if you just take an existing business model and you tell this company, uh, if you change nothing about the way you operate, but you need to serve lower income consumers, or you need to protect better the environment, you are going to reduce prices, you are going to improve, increase cost, and you don't need an Excel worksheet to know that this is going to impact negatively on your profitability. So the only way to achieve both goals is to innovate, to transform your business model. And large corporations, um, which is the topic of our conversation today, large corporations have a problem. They are a bit like trees, you know? If they are large, that means they are old. And if they are old, that means they are rigid. They have procedures, they have processes, systems that keep them very focused on the way they, they want to do things. And so for them to innovate is a real challenge. And I think a good metaphor for these corporations to engage and try to, be, to build inclusive business is really about starting a journey. And as you see in this picture, which I, I like, uh, the journey is uphill and it is not a straight line. Um, and it starts the journey with a recognition that they don't know much and that they need to both explore the world and at the same time find ways to quickly focus. Exploration and focus are two uh, contradicting terms, um, but that's really what companies need to do. Let me illustrate what I mean by this. The, the reason, the fundamental reason is that today we believe that the social innovation lab is full, but the scaling up plant is empty. The challenge of our generation uh, is not so much about innovating again or finding new solutions. It's about taking these solutions that already exist and understanding why they don't scale up and what does it take to, to get them to, to scale. And so because of that, the first task of a corporation when they are trying to tackle a, a problem is not to start from a blank sheet of paper, but to try to look for innovations that possibly social entrepreneurs, NGOs, startups may have developed and that they can bring to scale. Uh, a good example is Total, a, la a very large oil company Actually, Total was the first client of Histra 13 years ago. And we worked with them on the question of how to improve access to energy for low-income people in, in Africa. But instead of focusing on Total, we focused on the problem of access to energy. We looked across the world at the innovations that already existed in this field. And we found solar lanterns as being a fantastic innovation that could uh, replace a kerosene lamp in two to three months, the, 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 the savings on kerosene would have been enough to pay back uh, the lantern. So it should have been a no brainer for an African family to buy such a solar lantern. But then we understood that the reason why families hesitated before purchasing such a solar lantern was that the kerosene lamp uh, is expensive, it, it is dangerous to use, uh, the light is not good, but they know how it works. The solar lantern looks good, 
But if it breaks down, who is going to repair it? So we told Total, if you were willing to put your brand on the solar lantern, sell it through the 5,000 gas stations you have in Africa, telling people, if you have a problem, you can bring it back in the next two years uh, to the, in the closest gas station and we'll repair it or replace it because you'll have a guarantee. Uh, you'll do more to un unlock this market than any other institution could. And so they, this is what they did and they became the largest commercial distributor of solar lanterns. Now, the interesting thing is that what they did was leveraging their brand, which everybody knows in Africa, leveraging the 5,000 branches throughout uh, Africa, which is a unique distribution uh, system. But interestingly, these assets, when they used them, they didn't lose value. On the contrary, the brand was enhanced. This generated additional traffic in the gas stations. This improved their relationships with the African government. So large companies possess assets, idle assets that money cannot buy, but that are not going to lose value when they are used. And so this is why these large corporations are so interesting uh, to us. Another example is Codensa. Codensa was or is an electric utility in Bogota, in Colombia. And they were interested in trying to sell more electricity uh, to their poor uh, uh, customers. Um, and they, when they tried to understand why these poor customers were buying so little electricity, they found out it's because these families didn't have any electrical appliances. And the reason was that no one wanted to give credit to people who had no bank account and no in any side of credit worthiness. But then Codensa realized that these people, they knew that these families were paying their electricity bill on time. They had been doing so for years. They, had, they were sending a, an invoice to this family every month. They had a system to collect the payments back. So for them, it came really at zero cost to offer to these families to provide them with the credit to buy these electrical appliances. So they sent a voucher saying, you're a good paying customer. Uh, this is a voucher. You, if you sign it, you can go to the, this uh, retail shop where we have a partnership and you can buy yourself such an electrical appliance. And if you sign this, every month we will start adding to your monthly electricity bill an item which will be the repayment of the loan. Now, in a, in a few months, Codensa generated a $500 million loan portfolio. About one computer out of three in Bogota is sold through Codensa. So they had a major impact providing in a very cost efficient way, um, uh, financing loans to these poor families. Again, they did so because they had these idle assets. They had this data. They had this payment infrastructure that you could use at a very marginal cost. So that's, I think, the first thing companies need to understand is what is their sweet spot. And to do so, they need to bring two circles together. Obviously, it needs to be a meaningful, big problem for society. But the list, as we all know, unfortunately, is very long of these meaningful problems. But they also need to look at problems for which there, are, there is already innovations. There is a, a, a flurry, there is a, um, a lot of activity in the field and we see lots of innovations coming up again from startups, NGOs, social entrepreneurs. And then they need to focus on where they can add distinctive value because they have the assets physical assets, intangible assets, which can really bring a distinctive value added. And that's really at the intersection of these three circles that they need to focus. So they need to explore the world for what's going on out there, and they need to focus on the ones that they can contribute to most effectively. So that's the first thing they need to do. The second thing is they need to get the balance right between leading on the one hand and collaborating on the other one. We, there is a clear 
a, a critical role has to be played by what is called the social intrapreneurs. They need to play a key role because they need to have a vision. They need to have a lot of uh, ethics. They need to be able to deal with a lot of ambiguity. They need to be highly resilient. They need to be extremely good communicators. They need to show empathy, but also creativity. They need to have networks within the company and to, so they have internal credibility. So these people are really the most important people to get these large corporations to change. But that's quite internally focused. What they also need to be good at is at creating really a platform of benefits for, what their, for their initiative. We have seen many corporations and the programs that really work are the ones that achieve improvements on three dimensions simultaneously. They need to provide obviously meaning, uh, both for employees, for shareholders and for clients, um, but they also need to generate opportunities for future growth, new segments or new markets. They need to be a source of innovation, new products or reverse innovation for the existing core products and core markets. So, and we have seen, the projects we have seen succeed are delivering on these three objectives. The one that only provide meaning or only provide growth or, or are only about innovation, they fail to stand the test of time. And this was really what the Total Awongo program uh, meant uh, and the reason why it was, it was successful. Now, what they also need to be good at is working through alliances. And I'm giving you one because we are involved in running the incubator of the Business for Inclusive Growth, which gathers about 40 of the largest companies in the world together with the OECD um, to help these companies develop uh, inclusive businesses. And the idea here is that by learning from each other and by collaborating, these companies are more likely to succeed. And so the, the art of partnering, of building alliances is a critical one. So you need to be leading, you need to take risk, but at the same time, you need to be able to work with others and getting the balance right is very complicated. The, the third lesson we have seen is that they need really to adopt a very entrepreneurial approach. They need to engage in learning, testing, and learning again. And in doing so, is that they need to shift from looking at the world as problems. And here you see uh, a kid who is trying to study with this uh, uh, wick, uh, which is just, and, and it is obviously awfully dangerous to use and the light is of very poor quality. So it's very tempting to feel a lot of pity uh, for such a situation. But we need to look at them, at this situation as sources of opportunity. Uh, I'm going to here to tell you about quite provocative numbers, but if you look at the internal rate of return uh, for a family of investing in devices, such as the solar home system, it's about 60% um, internal rate of return. So the investment provides a 60% return. On a solar lantern is 150%. On a water purifier, because it avoids boiling the water, um, it's a 400%. An irrigation pump that allows you to produce onions, let's say, during the dry season is over 2000%. An improved cook stoves, that allows you to reduce by half your consumption of charcoal is a 5,000%. These internal rate of returns are immense, extremely high. I don't think that I, I would, I don't have such high internal rate of return opportunities in front of me. If someone was telling me, look, I would give you 1,000 euros provided willing to invest in Olivier Provided you demonstrate you have a, a 50% internal rate of return. Lanterns, home systems. Um, can you hear me? 
Yes, yes, we can. Yes, so something, something happened. Yeah, so, uh, so we see incredibly high returns, and so uh, much higher than anyone, at least me, probably any one of us could get if they wanted to invest some money to improve their lives. So the question is not that the cook stove is too expensive or the irrigation pump is too expensive. The question is, uh, are these numbers just nice numbers on the PowerPoint or are they for real? Do people believe in these numbers? Are they certain that they will get these investment returns? So it's a question of risk, not of return. So in, ensuring that we actually deliver and that there are people are able to make these investments and get the full return on this investment is really the challenge we have. And so one way of putting it is to say that they don't, they want, they need, and they want risk-free solutions, not cheap products. Patrimonio in Mexico is an interesting case. Um, Patrimo Cemex, the, the cement company, uh, realized that the lower income families actually were buying cement even when the construction market was down. They were paying very high prices for cement, much more, much higher than the commercial market. And so they wanted to grow their market share in this particular segment. And when they tried to lower the price of cement, this didn't change anything. People didn't say, wow, cement is cheap. Let me build an additional room. This is not the way it worked. So interestingly, uh, they realized that they didn't know. And, and the president of CEMEX Mexico at the time decided to publish their Declaración de Ignorancia, Declaration of Ignorance. We declare we don't understand this market and we want um, to make an effort to do so. And the team that was put together to do this research, very interestingly, I find, were not made of marketing people. They were not made of consultants. This was actually, there was a group of people coming from the Human Resources Department of CEMEX because they figured out that these people needed to go out and talk to these families and that the HR people probably were more adapt uh, adept to uh, have this kind of conversation. And it took them a few months leaving these families and they came up with an outstanding insight. They figured out that families, because they didn't have any bank account, you know, when they wanted to build an additional room, uh, they would each time they would save money and each time they would have a bit of money, they would buy a bag of cement, they would bag a, a bucket of paint, they would uh, buy uh, some concrete blocks, um, but because it took them, in average, five years to build a 10 square meters room, they wasted about 40% of the building materials they bought. And so the idea that came to Patrimonio, to a CEMEX, was to say, if we could compress this time, if we could really help people build sounder rooms um, more efficiently, we, if we could allow them to, to stop wasting this 40% of building materials, we could actually help them really realize their dreams. And so they created a program over 70 weeks where a family commits to pay a given amount of money uh, every, every week. And once the family has demonstrated their ability to, to do that, they start getting delivery of products but they have got some technical assistance from an architect to help them figure out the plans, to figure out the bill of materials, how much uh, materials they need to buy, and when the delivery should take place. And what's very impressive is that almost 99% of these families finish the program, and 80% of them decide to start a new project uh, in a, a few years later. So uh, um, this is, I think, a great demonstration that if you can reduce the risk of these solutions, make sure that people actually get uh, the, uh, the full benefits they expect, they expect 
from their investment, then price is not an issue. And this was a very profitable business uh, for Patrimonio because these families, uh, for Semex, because these families indeed pay a higher price. So there was no discount on cement, but there was a guarantee that they would deliver. The grandfather of my wife uh, used to say, I'm not rich enough to buy cheap products. And I think this is really the philosophy uh, that we need to have when we try to provide, uh, to sell things, products or services to poor people. We need to focus on making sure they are going to get the full benefits of the large investment that they are going to make in buying our product or services. Uh, and to do so, we need to design the pilot as a testing mechanism. We need to formulate the assumption we want to test. We need to do very quick and rapid prototyping. We need to do so to have monitoring systems which are going to give us information right away about and to, we can adapt uh, our program. And we need to have a governance uh, that allows for very effective and fast decision making. This is not the way we see most pilots happen. We see most pilots starting with a good intention, with the idea that we don't know exactly what we are going to find out. We are going there. We are there to learn. And two, three years later, um, we realize we have not learned much. And um, because it was not designed as a scientific experiment. The last point I wanted to share with you is that there is also a, a challenge once you have the pilot of uh, the, the tension between the need to protect this pilot and the need to mainstream it and the desire to mainstream. We, we see where to locate this pilot. Should it be done under the auspices of the foundation? So we, should we create a social business unit? So should we create a, a partnership with an NGO? Uh, should it be handled by the CSR, the Corporate Social Responsibility Team? Where to put it is often uh, a critical decision because we know that uh, there will be maybe budget cuts, there will be human resources decisions that could impact negatively the pilot. But at the same time, if we keep it in this very special place, very distant from the rest of the organization, then it's not going to impact and transform the innovation. We have seen multiple cases where successful pilots were remained at the periphery. I think uh, Stu Hart was talking about the, the pilotitis. Pilotitis, what he meant that that all these pilots are there that uh, do never transform the core business. And one program, which one initiative we are, very, we are very proud of collaborating with is the one uh, that Unilever has started. They, they have created this new climate and nature fund uh, in order to ha help them achieve their commitments in terms of net zero emissions, in terms of deforestation free supply chain, in terms of regenerative agriculture. So, um, so, but it could have been a foundation that was handling these commitments. But what I really love about this program is that this 1 billion euros, which is going to be spent over 10 years, is actually money taken away from the brands, from the budget of the brands, and that the brands can get it back provided they demonstrate that these projects are going to achieve these commitments and are going to generate consumer preference. So this 1 billion euros investment is actually designed as a nudging mechanism to get the brands to think differently about what they can do. And I think these kind of mechanisms that are going to ensure that what we do in terms of inclusive business doesn't rem become doesn't remain an exception, but is the beginning of a journey. Is the beginning of a transformation of a company. This is really what we are about. So uh, this journey, this uphill and zigzagging journey, is about getting the right balance between the desire, the need to explore, and the desire to focus the need to lead, but the need to collaborate, 
the need to learn and test and, and learn and to protect this project, but also to mainstream them. So that's what I wanted to share with you. I've tried to do it a bit fast, maybe too fast. I apologize if it was a bit rushed, but I was hoping to have a good conversation with you. And I'm very glad to see that uh, I have in, in our room some uh, people who are uh, remarkably well informed about this topic. Uh, my friend uh, Doug Miller, who is the founder of the European Venture Philanthropy Association and is, has played really a leadership role uh, in getting the world of venture capital to get interested in the world of impact. <clears throat> and first, David Green is my friend, David Green, the social entrepreneur who has uh, revolutionized the treatment of cataract. And so they are infinitely more qualified than me to talk about this. And I hope they will share with us uh, their wisdom. Olivier, thank, thanks a lot for this very uh, enlightening uh, webinar. Uh, please, if you have questions, you can either raise your hand or you could write them on the chat box. I, I have, maybe it's more of a comment. I mean, when you look at the definition of inclusive business, and I'm borrowing the, the definition of IFC, it says it provides like livelihood opportunities and addresses access gaps. Access gaps such as what you're saying, it's sanitation, uh, banking, electricity, uh, schooling, et cetera, et cetera. Now, my question is, most of the things that we've discussed are really around the access part, not providing the livelihood. Providing the livelihood, at least in my, you're enabling them to sort of get livelihood if you provide them with electricity, obviously but the thing is that to impact livelihood directly meaning to provide jobs this means that you have to include them in your value chains as an active participant not customers does that make sense it, it, it makes sense i just and you are broadly right in your in your comment however uh, i think this distinction is sometimes a bit artificial um, First of all, I mentioned irrigation pumps, which is about helping farmers improve their, their livelihoods. Mm -hmm. But when you take ele electricity or lighting, um, you, you may have realized that in average, we have 12 hours of night. People don't sleep for 12 hours, right? Let's say they sleep for seven, eight hours. So that means four to five hours a day are wasted because they can't see, right? Uh, I happened to, when I was a, a young, very young man, I happened to live in a, in a village where there was no electricity. These hours are very long where you can do nothing because you cannot see what you do and you cannot read, you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot do much when it's dark. So lighting has a huge impact on uh, livelihoods because it, it, it frees up uh, all these lost hours of work, um, which again is, is a single, four to five hours of work every single day is a lot, a lot of time. Now, uh, the, the transformation, the, this issue of risk-free solutions is exactly the same when, whether you are talking about improving giving access or when you are trying talking about improving livelihoods i'm going to say something which really sounds uh, very obvious but but it's profoundly true there is no progress without change there is no change without risk so therefore there is no progress if there are no if you are not able to take risk so this challenge, this question, so for instance, we looked at what kind of programs help farmers improve their livelihoods most, which ones were adopted first and fastest. One could have thought that it was the programs that it would improve the livelihoods of the farmers more. It's not the case. The programs that the new methods that are 
that are disseminated fastest are the methods that are reversible. That if you if you change your mind, you can go back to the previous evaluation. Another way of saying it is that they are risk-free. This the notion of risk and how to help these families or these farmers or these artisans address this issue of risk so they can improve their lives mm -hmm. is at the center of our problem. Okay, I have another question, which is different. I'm gonna go with uh, the, uh, the access part. Mm -hmm. Now understood that when you provide access to the base of the pyramid, it's gonna be more expensive than providing it in, in, in downtown Paris or yes. in, in Cairo, it's understood. So it's expected that the value price you're going to charge would be more yes sometimes when you look at the prices they are really obscene i mean they they it's not like a matter of 20 30 40 percent sometimes you're paying double the amount which tends to sort of is that an indication of exploitation how could you prevent such a thing the the words you used uh, are political they are, or moral. Um, they, the question is, in many instances, that indeed it's much more expensive to serve someone. If you uh, providing safe, safe drinking water to people living in cities is much cheaper than providing it uh, people in rural areas, density of population helps reduce the cost of, infra of infrastructure dramatically. So uh, indeed, a cost, uh, the cost to serve of these populations are, is going to be uh, infinitely uh, more, much more expensive. The, the real problem I see, if, if you want to talk about exploitation, <sighs> A friend of mine did a research, market research in India recently. He found out that the average family in this village had four, four broken solar lanterns in their home. Four. But the exploitation here is not that the, the solar lanterns were very expensive to buy. The exploitation is that they didn't work and that no one was there to improve uh, to, to make, make the after sale service. The problem is not the price. The problem is the poor quality, uh, the bad service they get. Because the price, they can make the decision, right? They can say, okay, is it worse? Is, is this solar lantern maybe a bit expensive? But compared to my kerosene lamp, uh, instead of getting a, let's say, <laughs> a 500% return on investment, I'll get to 250% return, but it's still a good investment. I'll still make it. But if the thing breaks down because they, if the person was cheated, if they buy a drug at an expensive price and the drug is fake, that's where there is exploitation. So let's move away from focusing on the price, which is the visible part of the iceberg, when the real issue is the quality of what they get and the returns they don't get out of these investments. But I see lots of uh, hands. Yes, uh, yes, yes. There are ready. lots of hands, and there is actually a question or a comment from Doug Miller. So I'll give it to Doug Miller, and then we'll we'll uh, we'll we'll, uh, we'll we'll go the raise hands. Doug, do you mind if you unmute, sir, please, and and ask your question? You are mute, Doug. You're muted, sir. No, we don't see you. No, okay. we see yeah. you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, first of all, let me apologize. I was on a, uh, a another call and didn't get into the uh, conversation until about uh, 15 minutes late. So uh, I'm uh, a little ignorant. But, but what I would uh, start out by saying, though, <clears throat> Olivier and I go back uh, at least uh, 15 years, and uh, I followed his uh, progress uh, all the way from Ashoka to, uh, to where he is now. Uh, and uh, it's great to see the uh, continued uh, evolution. 
Thank you, Doug. Yeah. Well, well, there was a question for me, or a, or or I, I I missed that part. I I thought you wrote a, a, a comment to the uh, to the to the uh, administrator of the. But anyway, fine. I mean, if if okay, no worries. questions, oh, and thank you, Doug, for attending. This is no problem. Just, just one. If I, if I still got the mic, just one thing to say that uh, uh, Olivia, I got in there where you were talking about uh, uh, stoves and cook stoves, and uh, I did fuel efficient cook stoves back in the 1970s with a group called Intermediate Technology, and what we found, uh, and the idea was to reduce the deforestation, and uh, you, you know we found that you would uh, improve the efficiency of the foot of the uh, stoves by better uh, circulation of, of the air. But, but then what we found out was the real benefit was that we were saving the eyesight and the lives of uh, these people living in uh, you know, quite uh, crowded and quite contained uh, dwellings and were uh, subject to the wood smoke and, and all of the uh, irritation. Uh, so there was, I think it was way more than a 5,000 return on, on the investment if, if you looked at it from a health as well as an economic and uh, climate perspective. That, that's right. I, I should say that the, probably the best marketer of cook stoves I know is a guy called Suraj in Ghana who has created a, an organization, a business called uh, Toyola. And he has probably the best slogan of all times. The, the slogan is, don't burn your money. Right. And uh, that's, that's a good one. Rosalind, please. Hello, can you hear and see me? Yes, we can see you. <laughs> Great to see you Thank there. you very okay. much for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I think in the context of this topic, I will call myself a serial social entrepreneur. To, so long ago, I was in the corporate world. Um, but um, I, so therefore, I've been on the side of the innovator or on behalf of them, approaching multinationals to explore some of these fantastic win-win models you just described. Um, and um, I suppose about 10 years ago, I couldn't get anywhere unless there was a visionary chairman um, who was the one that was needed to per persuade the rest of the board and then down to the chief executive and some of these staff that they needed to think a bit more out of the box of their normal um, uh, metrics for their p job performance. And then, and then uh, the corporate social responsibility department started to be formed and then sustainability units and directors. Um, but because I'm as passionate as I think you are about these being profitable models for the corporation and for the, um, and for the, the uh, entity which is doing the innovation, um, it's not really charity we're talking about at all. So my question is, even if there is an upfront investment required, do you see any trend in who is most interested to be the first um, audience or a recipient of these ideas within corporations? Is it shifting down from the board to the marketing department? So, um, or are we still relying on, you know, a, a wonderful visionary chairman like in the Unilever case to have already set the metrics to be um, triple bottom line for their own staff. Uh, that's my biggest challenge is who to talk to in the multinationals. Uh, ideally, you would like to talk to a division head uh, who, who is close enough to the business and can make the decision because the chairman or the CEO, they, they can allow things to happen but they are not going to do it eventually. So uh, you, you need, I think, to be closer to, to, to the business. So the head of the business unit is probably where, where you would love to be able to, to talk. My, what, what I've seen over the last uh, 20 years 
is that the, the conversations have fundamentally changed. I, th I think we are talking about things today that we would have never dreamed of talking about 20 years ago. I'm saying this because from time to time I need to encourage myself <laughs> that things that because if you look on the counter on the other hand about what is actually happening on the field, not much, not much, and, and the progress is extremely slow. But but we have conversations today that we couldn't have. But I think the key point, the key bottleneck today I see is the and you are you are talking about. I don't remember exactly your expression, Rosalind, but it was something like getting out of their comfort zone. That, that's really what we are talking about. We are in front of people who are today extremely well-intentioned. I, I hear more and more people saying, we need to do something. It's not possible to wait anymore. I, I really, this is a life, you know, in once in a lifetime opportunity to make a difference. I really want to do it. I'm willing to take the risk. Uh, I've made enough money anyway, so I want to do something. I want, I want purpose in my life. But they, at the same time, these people have reached the head, the top of these organizations because they have never failed in their lives. And they have never failed because they have never tried anything new. But they, that's why they have never failed. They have never been entrepreneurial. And so it's now they are in their 50s, 60s, they are the top of their game. And you are asking them for the first time in their lives to get out of their comfort zone. And they panic completely. And they panic completely. So, and it's not because they don't want to. Huh? It's because they have no clue on how to do it. And uh, it's for them extremely embarrassing to recognize they have no clue. Uh, they don't know where to start. Uh, they fear to fail. Their teams around them hate to see them undecisive and hesitating. So, um, I'm... I think really the bottleneck and I think my biggest battle today is to get them to, uh, to have the, the guts to say they don't know. Yeah. Like this president of CEMEX said, the Declaration de Ignorantia. Yeah. As we don't have a lot of time, Rosalie, could I ask David, who is an amazing social entrepreneur and uh, to, to speak now? Because he's okay. Andrietta, I, I swear you'll be next. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, that's a little bit great. Speaking. Okay, yeah, I, I'm sorry I'm not on the screen. I had to pick up my son from school. Uh, he wasn't feeling well in the middle of the webinar. <clears throat> uh, so I, I see that there's a lot of colleagues from Egypt. So I'll, I'll mention one example from Egypt uh, that I've been involved with. But first I'll, I'll mention a few other things. One is um, I've, I've worked both with corporations to get them to price for affordability, or ma ma mainly for medical products. And then I've also started um, companies that compete with large corporations uh, to, to change the whole competitive landscape. So Aura Lab in South India is an example. Today they have 10% of the global market share for um, intraocular lenses. We reduced the price from $300 to our lowest price lens of $1.20 today. And so uh, we've, we've done that for sutures, pharmaceuticals, surgical blades, all the ophthalmic products. And we've, we've developed an asset that Novartis, the largest healthcare corporation actually tried to buy, but of course we didn't sell. So, so there's, there's, there's another way to, um, address this this problem and that and that is how do you how do you design a company that reduces margins at all level and becomes highly competitive and profitable <clears throat> and, and and changes the competitive landscape where other companies start pricing for affordability always to the benefit of of the consumer which in developing countries is usually low income families so, so that's, that, that's one way. And then another way is to work with pre-existing groups that, that don't know how to reach the lower economic strata and helping them see through sharing examples and work, working with them how to find their way to make their products accessible to low-income people. So I, I was able to do that in Egypt, working with the Maghrabi group in uh, eye care, where 
they we, we had a high pay hospital and a low pay hospital in Saida Nafisa, one of the poor parts of Cairo. And the high pay part got, got going um, and it wasn't profitable. And by the time we got the um, low pay section going, we did like 2000 free cataract surgeries and that primed the pump in the market uh, for, for people to start coming to the high pay section. They, they saw, oh, if, if low income people are getting a good result, I can go there too. And, and so that's, that's how, the, that's how the, the, the high pay section finally became uh, profitable. And what happened is that the, the low pay actually generated more margin dollars than the high pay and became kind of like the jewel in the crown of the Mugrabi network, which today is like 34 hospitals serving 140,000 surgeries a year. And uh, um, <clears throat> what happened is that uh, with that jewel in the crown, they were able to attract funding from the International Finance Corporation, which then led to their uh, to their IPO on the Saudi uh, stock exchange. So, uh, serving low income people can be profitable, and uh, I've, I, I have a, a gazillion other examples, but that's just one that that pertains to. Uh, to Egypt, where it looks like a lot of you are from. Thank you. Oh, and Olivier, Kwayas Giddan Awi, good job. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we we have, I, I promised Henrietta that she would speak next, but I think uh, Dr. Shalabi should say a word if it's okay, because uh, he needs to be unmuted. Uh, Dr. Shalabi? All right. Yes. yes. He's, he's, he's unmuted. Now. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Ali and uh, Olivier. Uh, always glad to hear from, uh, from David. It's, uh, it's such a pleasure to, um, to attest to what he's saying. I really agree with... Uh, uh, and the fact that the business case of the social responsibility is, is really there. Uh, and what David has done with the group long ago um, was a proof of that. So uh, thank you, David. And it's a pleasure to hear uh, all the insights from Libya as well. And this, this shows that Egypt is also leading the way in, the, in this field, like in many others. And Rieta, would you want to share what you, you have raised your hand? Yes. You're on mute. Mute. Uh huh. So the the host have muted me. So now um I can the host has unmuted me now. Right. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Henrietta Mwebuzia, and I'm called, I'm here from Nigeria. I teach at the business school and um, I, I joined this because I'm quite passionate about impact investing which I've been teaching since 2012 and um, oh well you can't see me now because I'm actually in the car um, being driven but um, so that's why I don't have my video on I apologize for that so so basically um, first great presentation I hope to get the video because I meet I missed parts of it because I was in a previous prior meeting um, but I wanted to just well my point buttress is what David just said, which is that we've got to show that this is actually a competitive advantage, not just a nice to do. Because I always tell my students that um, no one will ever say Amazon or Microsoft are social enterprises, but they've influenced the world more than any social enterprise that we know. So at the end of the day, being purpose-driven, being impact-driven is a competitive advantage. And I'm glad that David was able to share some compelling examples about how they make even more profits than those who are primarily profits-driven and then uh, veer into C um, CSR. So like the speaker um, before David, I think it's very important that we, <clears throat> because we have different audience, okay? Capitalism has perverted most people to believe that profit is the only thing you should look for. But 
as time goes on, people need to understand that being impact driven is even more profitable because the, the mantra right now is that, yeah, well, you get below market returns or if you want to be impact driven, be non, non, non-profit focused. So I think I'll just stop there, but um, great presentation. I really love to get the video if it's possible. And um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Henrietta. No, I, I, I agree fully with uh, this notion. I think the issue, again, is not an issue of profitability. The, it's not an issue of prices. It's an issue of risk. And it's an issue of getting out of the comfort zone and having the, the courage to try out new things. And this is not what something large corporations are good at. So I think David gave a compelling example of how they can be provoked uh, into trans transforming themselves. Um, so I think we need both to use the stick and the carrot to can get I these big animals to work. Okay, can I quickly speak to the point of risk? So mm -hmm. one way to de-risk the sector is like you said in one of the slides I saw, to solve meaningful problems. So I teach people that a problem is a clear, profit, potentially profitable opportunity because when people have problems, they're subconsciously looking for the solution. So that's precisely how to know you've gotten a, a good idea if your solution is apt for, to solve the problem, if your, if your, if your product or service is, apt, is an apt solution. So um, once you're solving an existing problem, a meaningful problem, you, the risk is minimized. The problem comes when you're doing something just to make money for yourself. But if it's, the idea is targeted at a, solu at a problem, then you have a captive market already. And if that problem affects many people, then it's even more... Um, it's a little more compelling for you to, to enjoy demand if you meet that need appropriately. You mm -hmm. know, that's, that's, that's what, what I, how I train my students to see problems. Thank you, Henrietta. Thank you. Vinet. Okay. Could someone? Um... Yes, it was a wonderful uh, uh, presentation, Olivia. My basic question is regarding uh, the, uh, how do you, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, deal with the challenges of the, you know, a globalized world where we are seeing two set of countries, you know, one which are haves and one which are have not. So we have a country where, where you know, countries where we see, you know, which are less developed and where some of these projects, you know, like Belt and Road and are taking place, which are going to be using a lot of, you know, some of these uh, massive fossil fuels uh, because they are the only things available for them where there is no electricity and uh, where the automobiles basically work on uh, very traditional, you know, uh, components, etc. Because the electric battery vehicles basically use a lot, lot less, you know, <laughs> Uh, they are highly advanced, but at the same time, they use a uh, lot less, uh, I mean, components. So basically, they are going to create a lot of unemployment because of uh, the so advanced technologies are going to be some of these uh, less uh, polluting uh, technology are going to create jobless situation because of uh, high automation. So how does the developing world and emerging countries, uh, you know, deal with such type of uh, dichotomy? Because uh, Switzerland and Sweden can use uh, these uh, industries and uh, automobiles, for example, because the industry basically can, you know, have a high skill. They can use high skill labor, labor. But uh, some sub-Saharan African countries, you know, basically, uh, they were the auto industries and indus uh, even these traditional industries, carbon emitting industries, are, are the only source of uh, getting the services to the, you know, large delivery to the last mile. So how do they, you know, deal with this challenge of, uh, you, know, you know, these, uh, and how uh, for them, the net zero is, uh, is still a pipe dream. So how do uh, they, so uh, uh, thanks very much. I I think that this is a, a very complicated question. I would not pretend I have the answer. The, the only reason to hope, at least maybe it's a very naive view, but if we want to use less natural resources, which it seems is what we have to do to have a sustainable world. If we want to use less natural resources, we'll have to compensate somehow with more work. I mean, if you stop using, if you want to recycle uh, glass, uh, you are going to have to, there will be less material, but more labor. If you want to, each time you are going to want to repair things as opposed to throw them away, uh, you are going to, to recycle, to reuse, to repair all the, the circular economy kind of ideas are all generating labor. 
less material, more work. So I don't think there are some fundamental reasons to believe that uh, this uh, the go trying to be net uh, zero uh, carbon will generate will not generate employment. I think it will. It will. Just think of the number of of I mean the quantity of employment that would be needed to clean up any of our beautiful countries and get rid of the plastic bags that are polluting the river. So I, I, I don't see a world where there will be not enough labor for everybody, unfortunately, I would say. It is 8 p.m. your time, Ali. You are I the think so, yeah. and I, I don't think there are any more questions. I just wanted you to sort of comment, last comment about the concept of a hybrid value chain. How do you achieve this hybrid or hybrid organization? Or what is what is this all big fuss about hybridity or hybrid hybrid organizations? I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure there's a lot of fuss about it. I, I thought this was one of the concepts that was relatively protected from fashion compared to social entrepreneurship or social enterprise or inclusive <laughs> business or impact something or, uh, but um, I, I think I think the notion of hybridity uh, really is about um, and it's something Rosaline mentioned is that uh, how can we if we want to achieve goals that are both about improving profitability and achieving positive impact on people and planet. If we want to have these hybrid goals, we will have to invent new business models, new ways of doing things. We'll need to get out of our comfort zone. We'll need to be hybrid also in terms of the means, uh, the methods we are going to use. I think the world of NGOs, uh, of governments is going to have to learn from the world of business and the world of business is going to have to learn from the world of NGOs and businesses. So people who are able to speak both languages, who are able to, to, to get these two sides of the world to collaborate and learn from each other are going to be quite essential uh, in making us uh, progress. I say that between the world of civil society and business, there is, there is a no man's land. And I think this no man's land is probably the one which is most fertile for innovation and progress. So I hope we'll walk together on, on this no man's land. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, thank you for a very insightful webinar, great discussion. Uh, all people who are participated and registered will get a link with the uh, recording. And also if Olivier was, so can send us the presentation, we'll send it also to the all, all the people who participated. I thank you all for participating in this webinar. We look forward to seeing you all on next Wednesday, November 17th at 7 p.m. We have something again, slightly related. It's, it's the title of Spilling the Gap social enterprises and healthcare in low-income communities. We have three very interesting speakers, uh, Hal Glaser, uh, Health Impact Partnership, uh, Dr. Daphne Ngonji, she's from Access Afia, and uh, BP Agrawal, he's the president of Sustainable Innovation Incorporated, and the whole thing is moderated by uh, Dina Omar, who is also in, in uh, many aspects of social, social organization around healthcare. Uh, again, I thank Olivier and I thank you all. And I look forward to seeing you all next Wednesday. Stay right. safe. Thank you everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you, Olivier. I, I put my connect, uh, my information details if you want to reach out to me. Sure. Take care all, bye-bye. Thank you.